Good afternoon, everyone. And once again, a very, very warm welcome after this well-deserved rest. Today, we are going to have a lesson on the work energy theorem. But before we start with that, I would just like to thank you for all the wonderful questions that I received previously. There are some really very interesting questions and also some questions that really made me think. At the end of this lesson, I will pay attention to all your questions. Now, today's lesson on the work energy theorem is going to be, I hope, very useful because you see the questions on the work energy theorem is one of the most popular questions in the exam. And also, unfortunately, one of the questions that are not that well answered. But let's hope at the end of this session, that is now going to be the one question where you are going to score full marks in the exam. Now, when we want to do the work energy theorem, as is my custom, I would like to first of all, just get rid of all the troublemakers. Make sure that you understand all the little things that, that tend to give problems. Now, if we want to do the work energy theorem, we'll have to calculate work done. And work done is calculated according to the equation that we use on the data sheet under the section work energy and power. Now, the equation that we use is the one that says W equals F delta X cos theta, and that equation is according to the definition of work, which, which says work equals force times displacement in the direction of the force. So theta is the angle between the force and the displacement. Now, I think let's have a look at each one of these quantities in more detail and see what might give us some problems. Now, first of all, let's have a look at force. Now, never, 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 ever try to do a calculation in mechanics without having a diagram. Always have a diagram. Sometimes, in most cases, the question will provide a diagram. Sometimes the diagram will be just very flimsy. You'll have to add a lot of detail and sometimes there might not be a diagram at all. You don't even think of starting with that problem without drawing a diagram first. Now, usually the first part of the question will be that they will ask you to draw a force diagram. Now, let's have a look at an example of what exactly we mean by a force diagram. Now, suppose we've got this problem where the problem states something like this. A boy is pushing a crate across a rough surface. As you can see, the surface is quite rough. And you have to draw a force diagram for this crate. Now, a force diagram wants you to show all the forces acting on that body. Now, what other forces? Obviously, I think that one has already been added. You see what I'm saying? The, the, the diagram might contain a little bit of detail, but not all of it. So that is now the force exerted by the boy on the crate. What other forces are acting on the crate? Well, in the first place, the one force that is always present, you will n go nowhere in the universe where you will not experience gravitational force. Gravitational force is part of it. You'll always have a gravitational force. For us earthlings, the gravitational force is the force that the, uh, the earth exerts on any body towards the center of the earth, which means it's right down to the center of the earth. So that force is right down to the center of the earth, and that is the gravitational force. Usually, we want that force to start in the middle of the body because it, the weight acts through the center of gravity, which is approximately in the middle, in the center of the object. But it will be fine if you would draw the weight from there, for instance. It's perfect. So that is then another force, which is quite a hidden force. You must know that it is there. Right, but now the boy is pushing the crate, and the crate is moving in that direction. 
and the earth is exerting a force downwards on the crate, but the crate is not moving downwards. I mean, the crate remains on that level all the time. It doesn't move downwards. Why not? Because there is another force that is keeping it at that height, and that force is what we call the normal force of the floor on the crate, which will then always be right up. It's a normal force because it is at right angles to the surface. So that normal force is preventing the object from falling down. What else? Is there another hidden force maybe? Oh yes, remember what I said, that you're pushing this crate across a rough surface. So in other words, if something is moving across a rough surface, it experiences friction. And friction is always, always opposite to the direction of motion. So the frictional force will be in that direction. The frictional force will be in that direction. Right, I think now we've got all the forces. So let's see if what forces do we have. We've got the force exerted by the boy and the crate, and therefore the crate moves in that direction. We've got the gravitational pull of the earth on the crate downwards, but it doesn't move downwards because the normal force of the floor on the crate is acting upwards. And then there is the frictional force that is acting opposite to direction of motion. But if this question asks you to draw a labeled force diagram, surely these forces must all have labels, they must have names. And the problem now is that if you would draw a force diagram and you would have forces that do not act on the crate, if they ask you to draw a force diagram for the crate and you draw forces that are not acting on the crate, you're going to lose marks, they deduct marks. So how on earth am I going to make sure that I don't add any forces here that do not act on the crate? What I recommend you do is that you label each force in a nice full sentence with a subject and an object. So for instance, what you would do is, you would first of all say, this is the force exerted by the boy on the crate. That is the force exerted by the boy on the crate. And then you would say, this is the gravitational force by the earth on the crate. And then that will be the frictional force by the floor on the crate. And that will then be the normal force by the floor on the crate. What I want you to notice is that each one of these labels ends on the crate, on the crate, on the crate, on the crate. You see, this way you make 100% certain that you don't have any forces here that do not act on the crate. It's the force exerted by the boy on the crate, the frictional force by the floor on the crate, the gravitational force by the earth on the crate, and the normal force by the floor on the crate. Each one of these forces, you are 100% certain, are acting on the crate. If it happens that you've got a force there that where the sentence, the label ends not on the crate, you have to double check that. That might be a troublemaker. It might not be on the force. So just on the crate, just check it again, whether it's a force that is indeed acting on the crate. So I think this is now a force diagram and this is how you will deal with the force diagram. But now they might also ask you to draw, to draw a free body diagram. Now, what is the difference between a force diagram and a free body diagram? Now, in the case of a free body diagram, what we have now is that in the case of a free body diagram, you don't have the body and the floor and all that stuff again. This time, you have just a dot for the body that is, in this case, they, they asked you for a force diagram for the crate. Now a free body diagram for the crate. The dot represents the crate. Now what you do now is that all these, we've got, we've got the four forces, all four of them will still be there, but 
you must shift them in such a way that each one of these four forces starts at the dot. They have exactly the same magnitudes as before, they have exactly the same directions as before, but only now they have, um, they start at the dot. So you take the force exerted by the boy and you move it over there, starting. So that's the force exerted by the boy on the crate. You take the frictional force as it is in that direction and you move it until it starts at the dot. So that will be then the frictional force. And you take the normal force as it is and you move it over there, and there you've got the normal force acting on the crate. And you take the weight as it is, and you move it so that it starts at the dot, and there you've got the weight. So you see, you still have exactly the same four forces as before, but now, with the only difference, you've got only a dot, and all four of them start at exactly the same, the same spot. And now, once again, you can label them, you can say that that is the normal force by the floor on the crate, and you can again have the gravitational force by the earth on the crate, and you will still have the force exerted by the buoy on the crate, and you will still have the frictional force by the floor on the crate as before. So this is then the big difference between a free body diagram and a force diagram. Please see that you know which is which. And if in the exam they ask you to draw a, to represent all the forces acting on the crate using a force diagram, you have to use a force diagram. You're not allowed to use a free body diagram. If they ask for a free body diagram, you have to use the free body diagram and not the force diagram. So please make 100% certain you know the difference between the two. I think um, the other thing that we just need to know about forces is that in this case, we have now talked about some of these forces are sort of hidden forces that we have to look for. You have to know that they are there, like frictional force and weight. But some of these forces are what we call contact forces, and some of them are non-contact forces. Now, let's see which of these forces are contact forces and which are non-contact forces. Now, I think the name speaks for itself. Uh, contact forces are forces where the two bodies have to be in actual contact. They have to touch in order to exert the force. If we now look at these four forces that we've dealt with, the force exerted by the boy on the crate do you think the boy will be able to exert a force on the crate if he doesn't touch the crate? If he would just stand at a distance and say, crate, move. It's not going to move. He has to actually touch the crate. He has to be in contact with the crate. So in other words, the force exerted by the boy is definitely a contact force. There's no way that he can push it without touching it. It's a contact force. What about the frictional force? Say now, for instance, the crate would start floating on a thin layer of air or something like that. It's not touching the floor, and it's moving across the floor without touching the floor. Do you think the floor is going to exert friction on that crate? Not at all. It has to actually touch the floor in order for the floor to exert a frictional force on the crate. So the frictional force is most definitely a contact force. What about the normal force, the force that the, the floor exerts upwards onto the crate? Is that a contact force? Suppose you would remove the floor suddenly underneath the crate. Is it still going to support the crate? Is it still going to exert that upward force on the crate? No ways. It has to be in contact with the crate in order to exert that force. In other words, the the normal force is most definitely also a contact force. And what about the weight? If I would remove the buoy and the friction and the floor underneath the crate, would it still experience weight? Will the weight still be there? Oh yes, you remember what I said? Weight is always with us. Gravitational force 
will always be there. Whether this crate is flying or falling or going up a hill or down a hill or swimming, whatever it's doing, it will always have the gravitational force downwards. It doesn't need to be in contact with the Earth. It can be anywhere. The Earth will still exert the gravitational force downwards on it, even if it's far away from the Earth. In other words, the gravitational force is also, is definitely a non-contact force. It doesn't need to touch the body in order to exert the force on it. So there we've got now the two types of forces. I might just mention the other two non-contact forces that you might come across. They are electrostatic forces. So you've got two charges that are separated by a certain distance. If you think now about Coulomb's law, they are separated through a certain distance. They exert a force on one another and they're not touching. So that is most definitely also a non-contact force. And then also if you've got two magnets, the magnetic force is also a non-contact force. If you've got two magnets, they are going to either I attract or repel, and they don't need to touch in order to do that. So that's also a non-contact force. But most of the other forces that we come across will be contact forces.